Hello and welcome to our live streaming at this hour. I'm Yu Yang in Beijing. Today we are paying visit to the Grand Canal Forest Park located in East Beijing's Tongzhou district. It's actually the starting point of Beiyunhe or the North Canal. It's a major link of the Grand Canal to a river in Tianjin, which is called Haihe River. So actually in this park, we can see several stone sculptures where showing the major cities that the Grand Canal flows through. So actually, as you can see, currently we're seeing the stone sculpture of the city of Tianjin. Well, as we know, Tianjin is a major city in North China and it's quite famous for its snacks of course and actually it's located in North South Beijing and it serves as Beijing's Veit gateway to the sea as well as the largest port city in North China. It's about 134 kilometers from Beijing and it takes as short as 35 minutes to Beijing by bullet train. Once served the port of foreign concession in the 19th century, Tianjin still remains a lot of European-style buildings, including the former residence of celebrities, industrial and commercial enterprises buildings, churches and clubs on the five avenues. So if we move on, we can see that the Grand Canal is quite beautiful in recent years with really heavy and investigation. And for example, as we can see in Tianjin, we know that it's a famous river called Haihe River. And the Haihe flows slowly through the city and the towering Tianshan An is Ben Songyes. Taking a walk along the Haihe River in the evening and overlooking night scenery from the ferries will and must do things in Tianjin. In addition, the countless delicious food in Tianjin is moth watering. Snacks like fried cake and pancake fruit that can be eaten on the streets are the cream of the city's delicacy and the most authentic flavors. After Tianjin, the Grand Canal enters the Tangzhou city in Hebei province. Located in the southeast part of Hebei province, Tangzhou neighbors Bohai Sea to the east, Beijing and Langfang to the north, Baoding and Hongshui to the west and southwest, and faces Bingzhou and Dezhou of Shandong province across the Zhengweixi River to the south. It's 240 kilometers south of Beijing and 120 kilometers south of Tianjin. As near to the Bohai Sea, the Huanghai port in Tangzhou has become China's second largest coal export as well as the multifunctional international port. On the other hand, Tangzhou is famous as the hometown of Chinese Kung Fu and aerobatics. More than 52 schools of Chinese boxing originated from Tangzhou, accounting for 40% of the whole country. And Tangzhou's martial arts are strong, powerful and aggressive with the unique skills of pushing, deflecting the catching. And in ancient times, aerobatics as a form of entertainment was also a means by many folk artists to make a living. In Wuxiao of Tangzhou, many aerobatics used to perform at temple fairs, such as rotating a huge vest by using legs, animal performances, puppet shows, splitting bricks by hand, and climbing a ladder made by knives. If we move on, what we find here is Dezhou. Well, after Tangzhou in Hebei province, the Grand Canal enters Dezhou in Shandong province. Located in the northwest of Shandong, Dezhou city neighbors Hebei to the north and Shanxi to the west. It's 125 kilometers away from Jiannan, the capital city of Shandong, to the south and adjacent to the Shengli oil field of Dongyin and Jiaodong Peninsula to the east. The Sun Valley in Dezhou Development Zone is at the leading level in the field of solar thermal utilization in the world. Dezhou also produces exquisite black pottery with a history of more than 4,000 years. Under different lights, the black pottery has different lustres such as purple, indigo and silver and full of metal sands. Many parks with green landscape and fresh air are scattered over Dezhou. The tomb of the Sulu is the king, is the master sea post. In addition to sea sightseeing, 
If you want to taste the local specialties, the Dojo braised chicken with goat skin and aromatic flavor is definitely the most worth trying. It tastes smooth and tender and not greasy at all. You can also bring packaged braised chicken back to your family or friends. After Shandong, the Grand Canal enters one of the most beautiful provinces of China's Jiangsu. One of the cities it flows through is Yangzhou. Yangzhou is situated in the central region of Jiangsu where the Yangtze River and Beijing Hangzhou Grand Canal meet. It's close to Yangcheng and Taizhou to the east, Nanjing to the southwest, Anhui to the west, and Huaihe to the northwest. It's a small, quiet city with a long history and was named as the city of gastronomy by UNESCO in 2019. Fine workmanship and fresh ingredients are the two characteristics of Yangzhou cuisine. Famous dishes include braised meatballs in broad sauce, squirrel-shaped mandarin fish, Yangzhou fried rice and Wednesday dove. The local breakfast also offers many choices, from dried beetcock thread in cotton to three dice buns and shumai. Many of Yangzhou's specialist snacks and the time-honored shops are gathered in Dongguan streets and Dongquan streets. Yangzhou charms more than that as exquisite traditional gardens, beautiful waterscape and numerous historical sites along the Grand Canal also attract many tourists to visit and fall in love with the city. The slender West Lake just compares favorable with the famous West Lake in Hangzhou. And what's more, Yangzhou hosts the World Heritage, World Heritage Cultural Exposition in 2021 and the World Half Mother Stone Championship in 2022. So about 100 meters away from the sculpture of Tianjin and we are now arriving in the sculpture of Cangzhou as I mentioned earlier. It's actually a major city in China's Hebei province and it's actually quite near Beijing and Tianjin is located in the central office and it's a key city in the flows of the Grand Canal. So in fact, in these routes, we can find so many cities along the routes of the Grand Canal. For example, as we know that today, the Grand Canal flows through eight provinces and it's starting from Beijing and will arrive the Hangzhou in Zhejiang province. And as I mentioned earlier, Hangzhou is the home of Chinese Kung Fu and aerobatics. So as I just mentioned, after, Jiang, after Suzhou, we are entering Jiang, Jiaxing, which is the Zhejiang province. And now this is the, the Jiaxing city situated in northeastern Zhejiang province, the central part of Yangtze Delta. And Jiaxing holds advantage of geographic location adjacent to the Taihu Lake to the north. It lies across the Hangzhou Bay from Shaoxing and Ningbo and connects to Huzhou in the west, located midway between Suzhou and Hangzhou. It's no more than 100 kilometers away from Shanghai, Suzhou and Hangzhou. With more than 2,000 years of cultural history, Jiaxing has been a prosperous and busy place since the ancient times. The Wuzhen Water Town and the Xitang Water Town, highlights of Jiaxing, are still bustling and retain the original styles and the features. The waterways, ancient residents and bridges, winding stone roads and time-honored shops, not to mention many historical attractions, make them great antidote from the rush and busy daily work. And Jiaxing is also the birthplace of Communist Party of China, as the first National Congress of Communist Party of China closed successfully in the boats on Nanhu Lake in Jiaxing.
actually the end of the Grand Canal is, of course, the Hangzhou city in Zhejiang province. And it's actually the center of Zhejiang province's political, economical, and cultural residence. As the south terminals of Grand Canal, the city is located on the lower reaches of Qiantang River in southeast China, a superior position in the Yangtze Delta, and only 180 kilometers away from Shanghai. The subtropical monsoon climate contributes to varied seasonal sceneries, making Hangzhou one of China's most popular travel destinations all year round. The West Lake is undoubtedly the most renowned landmark, noted for the scenic beauty that blends naturally with many famous historical and cultural sites. The 10 West Lake prospects selects from the most frequently visited attractions around the lake give travelers a panoramic view of the city's highlights. Take a stroll along the causeway by the lake, you will feel the peaceful echoes of the city and better understand its why called the heaven on the earth. And this year, a water replenishment project bringing water to all of its dried out sections, enabling the full connection of the waterway of the first time in over a century. The northern part of the Grand Canal is receiving 155 million cubic meters of the water, and this will increase the length of the northern part of the Grand Canal by 112 kilometers and its water coverage by 9.5 square kilometers. And the water utilized in the project comes from multiple sources, including South North water diversion projects, the Yellow River, local water sources, recycled water, and water from rains and floods. But many cities along routes of the canal, such as Tangzhou, Dezhou, and Taiyan, say they're also benefiting from the projects, thanks to environmental restoration and new cultural attractions. Earlier, I have spoken to some experts at the China's Ministry of Water Resources on how the water replenishment projects has been managed. is still the northern starting point of the Grand Canal. Flowing through Beijing, the major city Tianjin and the four Chinese provinces, including Jiangsu and Zhejiang, is about 16 times the size of the Suez Canal in Egypt and 33 times longer than the Panama Canal. In 2014, the Grand Canal became a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Grand Canal is the main artery connecting the north and the south of China and has played an important role in the transportation of grain to the north through history. How it is now receiving water has great significance in the protection work of the Grand Canal as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It will help more people around the world to better understand the diverse culture of the Grand Canal and we hope in the future more and more people will come to visit the Grand Canal and it can become a window for the world to communicate with China. This year, a water replenishment project spraying water to all of its joint out sections, enabling the full connection of the waterway for the first time in over a century. The northern part of the Grand Canal is receiving 515 million cubic meters of water. This will increase the length of the northern part of the Grand Canal by 112 kilometers and its water coverage by 9.5 square kilometers. The water utilized in the project comes from multiple sources, including the South to North Water Diversion Project, the Yellow River, local water sources, recycled water, and water from rains and floods. Many cities along the route of the canal, such as Tangzhou, Dezhou, and Taiyan, say they're also benefiting from the project thanks to environmental restoration and new cultural attractions. The water replenishment project is expected to achieve three goals. 
first to reduce groundwater exploitation and replace about 600,000 mu of cultivated land in Tianjin, Hebei and other places for groundwater and irrigation water. Second, to replenish groundwater. The third one is to improve living conditions for residents in the cities and regions along the canal so as to improve the ecosystem of animals' habitats. Experts say the work which has gone into this very first effort to replenish the canal's supply of water will go a long way to rejuvenate the ancient waterway and keep drying out sections flowing with water well into the future. Yu Yang, CGTN, Beijing. It's the world's longest man-made waterway. The Grand Canal had been an important route for vessels to enter Beijing since the Yuan Dynasty, connecting Beijing's Tonghuihe River in the north and Tianjin's Haihe River in the south. The north part of the Grand Canal runs through Tongzhou, Xianghe and Wuxing. The canal connecting Beijing and Tianjin was first established in Dian Rhine in the Sui Dynasty. The Lushui Canal was opened and became the procedure of the Grand Canal's north path in Taihe Rhine in Jing Dynasty. And the rebuilding of Tonghuihe River in the Yuan Dynasty expanded the canal from Tongzhou to Beijing's urban area of Jingshui Tan. I expect to communicate over water between Beijing and Tianjin. Since the establishment of the People's Republic of China, resumption of water commuting between Beijing and Tianjin has been continuously brought up. To ensure smooth connectivity, Beijing and Hebei has established a water smooth connectivity. And actually, the two cities have also established a coordination mechanism to scientifically regulate the water levels and the water quality, promoting joint law enforcement of water ecological governance. The opening of the Beijing Hebei section of the Grand Canal is an important move to advance the coordinated development of the Beijing Tianjin Hebei region. All the elements of the Grand Canal presented in the serious pr prosperity of satisfaction authorities in terms of their forms and conceptions, construction materials, and location. They appropriately support and express the values of property. The function of use in particular are present and earlier recognizable in most of the elements. As an overall organization structure, the Grand Canal sites also express great authenticity in terms of appearance and the feelings they generate the visitors. There are, however, two difficulties in presentation of the property. The first relates to the very history of certain sections of the Grand Canal and the successive degrading, deepening and widening operation they have undergone. Along the technological alternation made to associated facilities, some of the sections presented are very clearly had been recently rebuilt, either in the same bed or alongside the earlier course. The second concern the landscape of certain urban or suburban sections of the canal. Once again, from the viewpoint of a historical canal, whose elements are supposed to be represent the long history of China. Despite a certain number of reservations, particularly for perceived historical authenticities and the landscape authorities of certain sections of heritage, which is moreover living and still in use. The conditions of authorities and the series as a whole and of the individual sites have been met. In, to, in 2008, the list of six key elements of the cultural heritage of China was moved and includes 18 sections and the 49 elements of the Grand Canal. This recognition by the Council of the State gave these sites priority in protection terms. However, the legal protection in place requires various improvements and extensions. It's necessary to systematically widen the protection of the banks to include immediate agent elements by extending the buffer zones along the canal. The state of conservation is generally good and determined that the diversive conservation policy has been carried out to its benefit. However, greater attention should be given to setting archaeological findings into a more critical perspective, clarify which historical period are actually presented by sections of the canal, and increasing the effort made by environmental and landscape conservation. The management system is based on several levels of responsibility. At national level, under the auspice of the State Council, the coordination of properties management in its hands of interprovincial and ministerial consultation group for the conservation of the Grand Canal. 
The group is made of the governments of six provinces and of the two cities with provincial status. The Water Distribution Office, the Ministry of Water Resources and the other ministerial departments concerned. The master plan is divided into 35 section conservation plans, of which have been prolonged and have been applied up to 2030. The 2013 and 2015 management plan has led to the fine turning of protection levels and improvement and re reinforcement of conservation. The enrichment and standardization of management measures, the precise definition and harmonization of buffer zones protection and the development of short-term action plans to improve knowledge of the property. The Grand Canal forms a vast inland waterway system in the northeastern and central eastern plains of China, passing through eight of the country's present-day provinces. Constructed in sections from the 5th century BC onwards, it was conceived as a unified means of communication for the empire for the first time in the 7th century AD. The record of canal excavation was dated back to the spring and autumn period or earlier. The development of canal reached its peak in the Sui dynasty. Before foundation of Sui dynasty, China had successfully excavated several ditches and canals, many of which had been salted up and suspended due to transition of natural environments. Some needed to be dragged up but still navigable, but were too separated from each other to form large-scale water transportation nationwide. The establishment of Sui dynasty declared the end of long-lasting split situation. In 205 AD, Emperor Yang Guang, the second emperor of Sui dynasty, ordered the excavation of the Grand Canal to meet the political, economic and military needs of the unified nation. In 211 AD, the Grand Canal was completed and became the main transport artery between South and North China. This led to a series of gigantic work sites creating the world's largest and most extensive civil engineering projects in some period to industrial revolution. The Grand Canal reached a new peak in Yuan Dynasty, providing a unified inland navigation network consisting of more than 2,000 kilometers of artificial waterways, linking five of the most important river basins in China, including the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. Still a major means of internal communication today, it has played an important role in ensuring the economic prosperity and the stability of China over ages. The Grand Canal represents the greatest masterpiece of hydraulic engineering in the history of mankind. Because of its very ancient origins and its vast scale, along with continuous development and its adaptation to consistence down the ages, it provides tangible proof of human wisdom, determination and courage. It's an outstanding example of human creativity, demonstrating technical cap capabilities and the mastery of hydrology in a vast agricultural empire that stems directly from ancient China. It bears witness to the unique cultural tradition of canal management via the Taoyun system, but it's actually a major transportation of grain in the ancient time. Consisting of an imperial monopoly of transport and storage of grain, salt and iron, and a taxation system. It contributes to the fundamental link between the peasant economy, the imperial court, and the supply of food to the population and troops. It was a factor of stability for the Chinese empire down the ages. The economic and urban development along the course of the Grand Canal bears witness to the functioning core of the great agricultural civilization and to the decisive role played in this respect by the development of waterway networks. The Grand Canal is the benchmark in terms of dealing with different natural conditions. 
as it reflects it in the many constructions that are fully adapt to the diversity and the complexity of the circumstances. It fully demonstrates the technical capabilities of Eastern civilization. And the Grand Canal includes important, innovative and particularly early examples of hydraulic techniques. It also bears really to specific know-how in the construction of dyer and bridges and to the original and use of materials such as stone, earth and use of mixed materials.